Good morning, good morning. Nice to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, I was over in Crawley last week with all the guys there. Doing great over there. Seeing lots of people. People getting saved, people getting added to the congregation. Uh, God's doing some great stuff over there in, in, uh, in Crawley. Um, Jay and I seem to be getting invited into all sorts of different situations as well at the moment. So we're a little bit here and there quite a bit of travelling, some of that might be over some Sundays in the coming uh, few months, but um, God is, God's doing something new, something fresh, um, not only with us, uh, but other churches in locally in the town and also in other places around the nation, and exciting days. In the midst of all the challenges, in the midst of all the chaos of what's going on in the world, God is on the move. God is not taken surprised by anything that is happening. He is Lord, he's on his throne, he's in charge. Three of you believe that, brilliant. Um, He is in charge. And our lives are in his hands. And how many of you know he has got the safest pair of hands out of anybody? All right, and so as we live daily, surrendering, submitting, yielding ourselves to him, we stay in his hands in that sense. Uh, I mean, in Christ, we're always in him, but we, we need to live that out and walk that out in the reality of our daily lives. Now, before we get into the word this morning, we're going to look at um, the authority we have in prayer. All of you or many of you will know we're doing a whole kind of series this first part of the year on prayer. How do you develop your own personal corporate, sorry, your own personal prayer life but also, what does it look like to develop the corporate, how we pray together as a people? How many of you know that prayer is the engine room of our lives? Amen. It's the engine room of a church. And uh, without prayer, we don't really see a lot of things happen. Part of what we do in prayer, enjoy your sweets, whatever you're nibbling there. Looks good, yeah, nice. Yeah, <laughs> chuck one up here. Um, no, not now. Um, Somebody's probably got a packed lunch here and, a, and a whatever over there and a coffee here and whatnot. It's funny what you see going on when, you, when you're speaking, what goes on. Some people are going like this, okay, all right, and you have to just carry on. Other people look like they're really interested, you know. Uh, other people get their phones out and you're like, are they looking at the Bible or are they playing something on their phone? Other people look like they're just having a bit of a conversation but trying to cover it up. Hopefully the guy preaching doesn't notice. There's loads of things that go on out there. Some of you even sit in the same chair every week. Oh, my word. I thought that only happened in certain type of churches. But some of you sit in the same... So if I want to know, is so-and-so here this morning? I'll just think, oh, they always sit over there. Oh, yeah, they're here this morning. But some of you, you, you kind of, you, some of you are just out there. And you sit in a different place every week. You are just the cutting edge Christian in the church. It's, it's amazing. Amazing. Wow. And next week, you're all going to sit on different chairs, different colored chairs. Man, I don't know if anybody can get excited about chairs, but anyway, you'll have some new ones next week. Brilliant. Now, this weekend, there are two, uh, two things going on. One in the church calendar, one in the Jewish calendar. In the church calendar, as we've already heard, this weekend is Palm Sunday, or today is Palm Sunday. In the Jewish calendar this weekend, it's Purim. And the two actually have a lot in, uh, in common. That's the word. Thanks, Charles. Thanks. <laughs> we're, we're all preaching the message this morning. Um, there's, there's, there's two things they have in common. We've heard some of the things from what Colin said earlier about Palm Sunday. And if you don't know the story, uh, Jesus comes into Jerusalem on a colt, on a donkey, and the people are taking branches off trees, palm branches and other things. They're, They're even taking their cloaks off and they're laying them on the ground. And while he's coming into Jerusalem, they're praising him, they're they're giving him adoration. And as he explained earlier on, they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And the word Hosanna, again, as he said, means to save or to save us. And it, it means to come and save us. It, it was actually a cry. It, it wasn't just praise. It was actually a cry that came from their heart saying, save us. There was a recognition that he was the saviour yeah. in that moment. 
and crying out salvation, come and save us uh, in, that, in that moment. And Jesus came as a Jew and he came for the Jewish people. Paul says in Romans 1 verse 16 that he wasn't ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew and then for the Gentile. So Jesus came for every person, every race, every colour, every creed. He came for every person. But the Bible's very clear. He came as a Jew. Jesus was Jewish. And he came primarily for the Jewish people to save them. And as a result of coming for them, salvation is also for us. Jesus died once and he died for all. So God's not on anyone's side in any conflict that is going on in the world, including the one in Israel at the moment. God is not on anyone's side. God is on his own side. The Jews need a revelation that Jesus is the Messiah and Arabs, uh, Palestinians, uh, Muslims, those that don't necessarily believe in Jesus as the Saviour, they need a revelation that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Saviour. And so it's not like pick a side. The only side we can pick is God, okay? And his heart is for every Jew that lives in Israel, every Arab that lives in Israel, every Palestinian that lives in Gaza or in the West Bank. He loves every person. Okay? So important. Um, Maybe we'll come on to some of this in a moment when I say some other things. So Jesus came and in Palm Sunday and what it represents, it was a declaration of salvation. A week later, Jesus went, well, within a week, Jesus went to the cross. And on the cross was the word Inri, which means King of the Jews. So he was crucified as King of the Jews uh, because he came for the Jewish people. And he came for the Jewish people knowing that the original disciples would be Jewish. He was going to baptise them in the Holy Spirit and then they were going to take the gospel not only to the Jewish people but to the nations. What was the commission that... Jesus gave to the disciples, it was go and make disciples of all nations, nations, not just the Jewish people. So Jesus came for the Jew, but also for the Gentile. But we need to understand his heart for the the, the Jewish people in what, uh, what happened. Why? Because he wanted to save them and rescue them from an eternity separated from him, an eternity in hell. He wanted to separate them out from that to an eternity with him. And the same it is, the same for every Gentile. What has that got to do with Purim? Purim, if you don't know what that is or what that's about, it's a celebration in the Jewish calendar. It's a festival they celebrate every year because about 460, 70, 80 years or so before Jesus was born, B.C., uh, in Susa, which was in Babylon, uh, the, a lot of Jews had been taken into exile to Babylon and <clears throat> one of those Jews was Mordecai. And in the kingdom, in that kingdom at the time, the king was Xerxes and there was somebody who was exalted in that kingdom as the highest official or the f- highest noble. His name was Haman. And some decree went out to everybody who lived in in the city that they all had to bow whenever he went past. But Mordecai the Jew, he didn't bow to Haman. Haman didn't like that. He got offended with that. And to cut a long story short, because our focus isn't just on on this this morning, um, he decided that he wanted to not only get rid of Mordecai, but also his people, the Jewish people. And so... Uh, Mordecai did a little bit of, uh, sorry, Haman did a little bit of a number on the king to manufacture a decree that was then put, was signed by the king that went out to the whole of the kingdom that on a certain day, it's called Purim because Purim means lots, okay, to, to cast lots. And there were lots that were cast to determine the day that the Jewish people were going to be annihilated, all murdered. 
And so this decree went out that on a particular day, everybody everywhere within the kingdom that was not Jew, not Jewish, was to kill all of the Jewish people, every man, every woman, every child, and that this decree went out to do that, okay? Um, now Mordecai, having obviously hearing this um, uh, plot that was going out, uh, he had a niece called Esther. She was the queen and married to the king. And she was a Jew. And he got a message to her saying, this is what's going on or, or the other way around. And, uh, and basically challenged her to go before the king and to let the king know this is what was going on. And, and nobody could approach the king without the king asking for them to come before him. Even the queen couldn't just go in to his, his uh, presence without him requesting. And she said to Mordecai, her uncle, if I go in there without asking, that's, that's, that's my life, I've had it. Um, because anybody that goes in and approaches the king without him requesting is death. And, uh, and so Mordecai challenges her and he, he says, look, he said, do you think that you will be saved just because you are in the palace? and everybody else is going to lose their lives, do you think that you are, you are called for such a time as this? And so she said, okay, what I want you to do then, if I'm going to go before him, oh, we've got to pray and fast, and I want you to pray and fast for three days, get all the Jewish people to pray and fast so that we pray, so that I can then go before the king and have favour before the king. And she, during the prayer and fasting or at the end of it, Goes she goes before the king and instead of um, her being thrown out of his presence and then what that means, uh, he saw her and he said, come before me. And he said, you can have up to anything, even half of my kingdom. That's pretty cool. And uh, anyway, she then requests that he comes to a banquet. And to cut a long story short, through a couple of banquets that she invites the king, her husband, and then Haman, the guy who wanted to get rid of all the Jewish people, calls him to a banquet. And in those two banquets, what gets exposed is the plan that Haman um, put into place to get rid of the Jewish people and how he had manipulated the king to make that decree. He, the king turns that decree round and says, right, we're going to change that decree. And instead, what we're going to put out there is a decree that says all the Jewish people uh, will not be uh, murdered. They will not be annihilated, but they must have life and everything. So in one sense, it was a salvation story, one that was going to mean death, annihilation for a whole race of people, but yet their salvation came into being, into place. And so the Jewish community, the Jewish people all over the world celebrate today Purim, or each day whenever Purim is each year, um, as salvation of their people from annihilation. Okay. So Purim and Palm Sunday go together because both are a declaration of salvation. Both are a declaration of rescue and both have a connection to prayer. She prayed and fasted and went before the king to rescue her people from annihilation, from death. Jesus, after going into Jerusalem, what did he do? He went into the temple. When he went into the temple, he turned over all the tables of the money changers and in that moment, he said, um, my father has, uh, has called this place, the, the temple, to be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Now, we know for us now, we don't have to go to a building to worship God. The Bible clearly talks about that we have now become the living stones, that we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit, that God doesn't live in a building. God in, lives in people. We know God's bigger. He's not just limited to living into people. God is God. He's the creator of the universe. The universe is expanding right now because when he said, let there be, things have just been expanding since then and going since then. He's the creator, amen? But he comes to live in us. And so we've now become a carrier of his life, a carrier of who he is. Now, there, there was a situation in Esther's day where something needed to happen because people were going to be taken out. Now, we know for generations upon generations, the Jewish people, there have always been plots and plans to annihilate the Jewish people from the face of the earth. 
just to take a few moments, the situation in Israel right now is not just um, a bit of an attack on October the 7th and then a bit of revenge for a few months through, through Israel. This is part of a much bigger narrative to do with the annihilation of the Jewish people. From the river to the sea is a statement that is about the annihilation of Israel as a nation and of the Jewish people to wipe them off the face of the planet. That's what that phrase means. It doesn't matter what the media are saying and what all the political correctness is. That's, ex- that's what that means. Okay? And <clears throat> that's just part of what is happening. Now, for many Jewish people, they would say Purim in Esther's day was the small Purim And there's a much bigger one still yet to come. If you read the the story in here, if you read through Revelation and you read what begins to happen where all the nations turn against the nation of Israel. There's a lot of that going on at the moment. If, If all you do is get your information from the news you'll be really struggling with what is going on because it's pretty, it's pretty difficult watching the news as to how it's framed and what is being um, communicated. It's like, you know, sometimes when you have a photograph and somebody only shows you a certain amount of the photograph, it looks like a certain story is being told. But if, you, if then somebody, you see the whole picture, there's other things in that picture, then put that into perspective and you go, oh, it doesn't look like that. There's a much bigger picture here that changes the whole way you think about what you've seen. So we need to draw back from just looking at the news and what is being communicated and portrayed through the media in, in terms of all the, the terminology that they're using. In the middle of that, people are losing their lives. Which is obviously not God's heart, right? For people. Uh, people are losing their lives. So we, we come with compassion, but this is why I said earlier, this is not about sides. As in, well, which side are we on? We're not on someone's side. This is about being on God's side. Now, he loves Israel. He's called the God of Israel. Now, in God's mind, Israel is a place. It is a nation, but it's a nation of people. It's not just a political state in God's mind. Israel in the Bible is is a, a nation of people that he wants to reveal himself to and then reveal himself through to the world in that sense. So when he looks at Israel, he looks at the people. He doesn't just look at a political state as to what they are or aren't doing. At the heart of that, what God wants is the nation, the people in Israel, to turn to him once again and cry out once again, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, come and save us, come and rescue us. We need you, God like that cry needs to be in any nation because pretty much every nation of the world is not worshipping God, it's focused. So God wants that cry to come up in in every nation. But what did Esther do? She interceded, she went before God. What did Jesus do when he was going into the temple? He was reminding them because they got into all the traditions and living to certain things and (coughs) selling some doves and animals in in the temple wasn't wrong because that's what had been set up to do so that they can come with sacrifices. But it was the way in all, it, which it was all being done to, to, to extract more money and all of that from people and all the trading that was going on beyond just what was necessary for somebody to bring an offering. And he was reminding them, hey, guys, this, this temple is not just made of stones. There's a living temple that God wants to come and reside in. And God, God wants to restore the people to become a house of prayer, a people back to relationship with him. We are blessed because we have God in us. We have relationship with the living God, right? And so we're going to look at a few scriptures this morning to to encourage us and to show us the authority that we have in prayer. What does that mean? When you've got authority, that means you've got confidence. That means you've got a boldness. Now, boldness isn't always expressed in like, yeah, in a loud way. Boldness and confidence can be actually quite quiet. Because when you know what you have, it's not the external expressions 
that communicate, I have authority, because authority is what you have on the inside because of what has been given by a greater authority than yourself. Uh, are you there? When we try and do things in our own strength, we try and we, 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 there's a lot of self-effort and we, sometimes the way we pray, sometimes the way we say things, and even when we say in the name of Jesus, sometimes we think if we say that in a certain way, that will definitely make it happen. If I say in the name of Jesus... Something's going to happen. And what we're doing, we're putting our faith in the way that we're saying something. We're not putting our faith in who he is when we think the way we express something, well, if I pray like that, God's going to go, hey, I love that. I'm just going to do it because of the way they said it. Or if we say it a certain way that the enemy is going to say, well, the way they said in the name of Jesus there, I've got no chance. Um... The enemy recognises the authority that we have. Yeah, that's right. He knows the authority they have, but he also knows the authority that we exercise is in relation to the surrender and the mission and the yielding to that authority. That's right. That's right. That's right. right. I'm going to come to, to some of this uh, in, in a few minutes. So I've got a ladder here. Um, this has definitely been health and safety check. This is like, you know, a very secure ladder. So for those of you that are, you know, health and safety geeks, um, I'm not going to ask anybody else to join, step up the ladder apart from myself. Is that all right? Yeah. Um, so you guys are the world. Is that all right? Yeah. So just look like the world for a minute. Thanks. All right. This is, uh, up here is the rock of salvation. And, uh, <clears throat> and so at one time, all of us were living like this yeah. in the world, Okay. And someone somewhere shared the gospel with you in some way or other and you responded to the gospel when you said yes to Jesus. You, you gave your life to him and you, you asked him to forgive you. You repented of your sin. And, and that transformation that happened in that moment and what God's been doing since in your life. So when you gave your life to him, you came out of the world and you came onto the rock of salvation. So your life is no longer built on sand in that sense. It's now being built on the rock. You can still make decisions, okay, that, that, like sand decisions that are not based on who he is because we can still do stuff outside of his will and purpose and we can still make decisions that are not in line with his. And when we do that, we're putting ourselves on shifting ground. But, when, but in terms of who we are in Christ, he's brought us into, onto this rock of salvation and this is what it says in Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 10. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. What does that mean? When we were in the world, so we, st we still live in the world, but we're not of the world yeah. in that sense. Let's just put it that way. So, we st so this is just a pictorial analogy, but all of this is actually all together in one thing, right? But it's just to separate the, the visual analogy for a moment. He made us alive even when we were dead in our transgressions. What does that mean? Before you knew him, Jesus had already won the victory for your life on the cross. Amen. He'd already dealt with every sin, every pain, every shame, rejection, guilt, everything that you could go through. He'd already taken to the cross. So even while we were dead in our transgressions, we weren't alive to him, yet he'd already done something to make it possible for us to come alive in him. Amen. Are you there? Are you with me? It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ. So he's brought us onto the rock of salvation. And then let's just read this, okay? It says he's raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms. In Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. In the coming ages. We are living in the coming ages from that time. Generations down the road, okay? You look really small from up here. Um, for it is by his grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. So coming from there to here is a gift. You can't earn it. You can't do anything for it. The only thing that we did to receive the gift of salvation, the gift of his life, 
and to be seated with him in heavenly places is to say, Jesus, forgive me. I repent of my sin. I turn around from all of that stuff. Would you cleanse my heart? Would you cleanse my life? And, and now I want to know you. Would you come and live in me? I give you everything that I am, the good, the bad, the ugly. Would you come and live in me right now by the power of your Holy Spirit? And I want to walk with you and know you for the rest of my days. Yeah. It's a gift. Yeah. Salvation is a gift. It's free. Yeah. But living that salvation out day by day, yeah. it's going to cost you everything. Jesus said, you take, you, you, you take up your cross daily. What does that mean? Well, he knows that we were gonna have, we're going to face decisions every day that either want us to take us back to that life or for us to continue on to live a yielded, surrendered life. So to walk out this relationship of who you are in Christ, this is our position. Yeah. That will never, ever change. Our position is here with Christ at the right hand God's sitting here. At the right hand of the Father, we're seated with him. That position will never change. But we have to live that position out. We have to work that out in the world where we are, with the temptations, with the challenges, with the chaos, with the, with the negativity, with the corruption, with everything else that's going on. We, we're taking this life in one sense, and what we're doing, we're not living remote from the world, but we're taking this position of who we are in Christ, okay? So we're living in him right here, clothed with Christ, okay? Jesus said to them, before you go and do anything, go wait to be clothed with power from on high. Because he knew we were going to need this. Understanding this is who we are as a believer. And I can't carry this and sit on this at the same time. Um, no, no, I haven't learned how to do that yet. I'm not in your league. I'm not, I haven't reached that level of spirituality yet. If you, do you come and show me how you... All right, don't interrupt, okay? I'm only joking. <laughs> um, and, and so what we do is, is we don't live remote, separated from the world. This is going well. Um, what we do is we live in Christ. And, and if you lot are all the world, you don't know Jesus. I'm living in who I am, in him, in the world, amongst everybody that doesn't know him. Okay. But I'm, I'm still, this is my position. I'm a child of God. I'm a son of God. I'm an heir with him. He's clothed me in his righteousness, in his, his love and everything else. And, and that position gives me authority as a child of God to do things in his name. Because the, the Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. Okay? And so, in the same way that Jesus, when he called the disciples together uh, in, in Matthew 10, it says he gave them authority. Yes. He gave them authority to go and preach the, the good news of the kingdom, to lay hands on the sick, to drive out demons, to um, whatever the other things are. Drive out, heal, raise the dead and cleanse lepers. He gave them authority. Yes. And so what God does with us as believers, he gives us authority. That authority is not based, him giving us authority is not based on us trying to earn it. He gives authority in relation to us being his, his children and therefore in this, he gives us authority. How we exercise that authority, that's our responsibility. That's right. And that's where us living yielded, surrendered in a day-by-day -day relationship and surrender with God determines how that authority is released through our lives. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Amen. We, we, it's only God's grace. God's grace enables all of this to happen, right. okay? Right. Yeah. But sometimes what we've got to be careful of is grace doesn't change, doesn't replace our responsibility to live in who we are in Christ and the responsibility that we have to live clean before God, to live right with one another in good relationship. When uh, 
I've got all these scriptures down, but um, we'll just talk them through. So, some, most of you know this story. Jesus was wherever he was one day. Centurion comes or, um, to find him, or it depends what you read. Centurion or the servant of the centurion. But the centurion comes to find Jesus. And he says, I'll come to your house. And listen to the centurion's response. He says, um, yeah, I know it, it's just what word he uses. He said, you don't have to, you don't have to come to my, I don't, I don't deserve you basically to come to my house. But if you just say the word. And what um, he understood was Jesus has an authority because he submitted to an authority greater than his. And what, is, what, what does the centurion say to Jesus when he hears that? Because Jesus says, well, you know, well, go, your servant is healed at this very hour. But what does he say? He says, well, I've not, not heard or seen such great faith in that moment. But what does the centurion say to Jesus? He said, I, have, I, have, I am under someone else's authority, but I have others under my authority. And if I tell them to go and they go, and if I tell them to do this, they go and do it. So he understood the delegated authority and how that operates. Okay? And so... Jesus operated under delegated authority from the Father to him. Then he delegated authority to the disciples to go and do things in his name as if he was there. And that's the same for us. So we live under the authority of the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he delegates that authority to speak in his name and to do things in his name, to pray in his name and to act in his name. How effective that authority is, is determined by how we walk surrendered to him. Sometimes what we do is we think then, come back to this, that, oh, well, God's grace, that's all right, it will cover it, no, no worries, no worries. That's God's mercy that covers things, that doesn't deal with us as we deserve. God's grace enables us to live and be who God's called us to be. All right, so mercy forgives and deals with the issues. Grace enables and empowers us in the spirit to be who God's called us to, to be. And so things like consecration, being consecrated before him, living humbly before him, living obedient before him, we don't, we don't like those words because if we're not careful, it, turn, it makes it sound like, oh, right, the works of consecration or obedience. No, no, no. Every day we're all faced with temptations, challenges, through people or scenarios that are going on in, in life. And um, how we respond to those and how we walk in those or walk through those is really, really important. There's a, there's a, a, a scenario in Acts where there's the sons of Sceva, I think they're called, and they're doing things in the name of Jesus. And they are, they are going around trying to cast demons out of people. And, and they try to cast a demon out of one guy and uh, this, this demon speaks back to, uh, to them and says, um, Paul I know and Jesus I know, but who are you? Yeah, that's right, absolutely. absolutely. And they, get, they got beaten up. I'm, yeah. I'm not saying we're going to get beaten up, right? But we have authority yep. in Christ yeah. because that's who we are. And God wants us to exercise that authority in prayer. That's it. But it is connected with how we walk yeah. with God, yielding under that, his lordship, under his authority and in that, that way. Because when we're, when we're praying in the spirit, we're, we're, we're not just saying words into the air. Right. There are spiritual realities going on yes. when we pray. Um, some, sometimes things are stubborn, aren't they? Yeah. Sometimes we don't get the answer right then and there. Things are stubborn. Right. Mm -hmm. Daniel prayed in the book of Daniel. And after 21 days, yeah. the angel appears to him and said, the moment, the day you began to pray, the answer was released. Right. But it took me 21 days yeah. 
into battle in that spiritual realm to come and bring you the, the breakthrough, the answer, the release for what you've been praying for 21 days. Are you there? So just because you don't see something happen now, it doesn't mean it hasn't worked. Sometimes there are some things that are stubborn in prayer that we need to continue to push into and push into. Two scriptures, okay, just to, um, that we will uh, look at. John 15, it talks about, I am, I am the vine and you are the branches, verse 5. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This is talking about remaining, walking with God, keeping in relationship with him, that moment by moment walk with him. Um, if you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. That doesn't sound, no, not very good. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask, this is brilliant, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. But what does it say? If you remain in me and my words remain in you. In John 6, 63, it says in there that God's words are spirit and they are life. So God's word has the spirit and life in them. And so in and of itself, God's word can produce what it is in and of itself because it is life. Yeah. It is spirit and life that is released. And it has the power in itself, because it is God's word, to fulfill, to do, to accomplish whatever that word is, because it is life, it is power. And what he calls us to do is if we remain in his word, then whatever we wish, what's going to be in us to pray is God's word, God's will, God's purpose, God's heart. And when we pray in line with his will and it, with his word, what happens? Things must change because we're praying as a child of God in the authority we have as a believer and we are speaking his word into a situation. We are declaring his will into a situation and something has to change. Anybody believe that today? Right? And, and so faith is not passive. Faith is active. So what does faith do? When God speaks to you or me about something, he shows us something in the Bible, faith is released. Something is activated in us. Yeah, I believe that. Wow. If something comes alive in you, it's like, yes, amen, yes. Because something, suddenly the words on a page suddenly become life on the inside of you. And when something comes alive because God has spoken it, or you read it and the Holy Spirit goes, that's for you right now, or that's for your situation right now, or that's for that person right now, something on the inside of you goes, yeah, right, oh yeah, yeah, right. And then instead of praying in a way that you're trying to, I hope I'm saying the right thing, and I hope I'm saying it long enough, and I hope I'm saying it in a way that God's going to answer, suddenly when something becomes life on the inside of you, all the self-effort drains away. And suddenly you're going, Father, thank you. That's it. That's it. That's it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for your, your word. I thank you for the answer. Thank you for the release in this situation. I just speak that word, whatever it is. I just declare that right now. And something has changed in here and something changes in the way. And, and even though you pray like that, it comes with an authority but it comes from a place of revelation, a place of faith, a place of having received. That's what God's saying. That's what God's saying. That's what God's saying. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And because you've heard something on the inside, it's like you've received it. Amen. It's like you've received the answer. You've received the outcome. Because the outcome's no longer down there somewhere. The outcome or the answer is now in here. Do you understand that? Are you, are you getting that? Does that make sense? So when we're praying with authority, it's not what can I muster up to make it sound like I'm in charge and the devil's going to run like anything when I pray. What else does it say in here? 1 John in the Word, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to 
his will, his word, right? He hears us, and if we know that he hears us, then we, whatever we ask, we have what we ask of him, okay? So we're not coming to God, it's like, God, oh, please do this, please do that. What we're doing when we come to him to pray with authority and to pray with confidence, what we're doing is we're coming to him saying, Father, I don't know what to pray. I've got loads of thoughts, but I don't know what to pray in this situation. When we, we've spoken quite a bit recently on praying in tongues, praying in tongues, praying in tongues, the importance of that, the power of that. And when you pray in tongues, you begin to get the mind of the spirit, yeah. not just our natural thinking or our natural intellect or our natural reasoning or whatever. And <clears throat> because when we pray in the spirit, we're beginning to, we're pr- and the Holy Spirit begins to give revelation, give understanding, the mind of the Spirit. We understand things and go, right, 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 okay. And he begins to speak and show us some, something from the Word about the situation. We're right, thank you, Jesus, thank you. Because when you're praying the Spirit, you're not just praying with your natural mind to try and understand what's going on. You're praying in the Spirit and God speaks. And that's all part of then faith being activated. I know what God's saying. Thank you, Jesus. Then you start praying with thanksgiving, which we covered a few weeks ago as well. It's all intertwined in the way that we pray, right? And then suddenly there's loads of life in prayer rather than something that I do. I've got to go and do some prayer. Go and, And it's like, no, this is relationship with God. It's like, Father, I thank you. You want to move in this situation. You want to change whatever's going on. You want to turn it around. You want to bring a breakthrough, whatever. And so I don't know what to pray. So you pray in tongues or whatever and God begins to speak, show you, gives you scriptures. You begin to pray with others and God gives some understanding, some revelation. That brings confidence. It releases faith. And then you pray in a different way because it's like, Father, thank you. You're in charge. Fear begins to take second place because faith now has replaced anxiety, worry, fear on the inside because, and that gives you confidence now when you pray. And you know, sometimes when you even pray like that, it's not even putting in the name of Jesus at the end of it. Because that, just saying that is not like a magic formula. If I put in the name of Jesus at the end, because sometimes we pray things that are probably not actually in the name of Jesus, It's what we think we should pray. And the Holy Spirit's going, I know you've put in the name of Jesus at the end of that, but actually I want to show you something to pray in a way that's going to bring change and bring an answer. And if you just spend a bit of time listening to me rather than just praying what you think needs to happen, just listen to me for a few minutes. Or if you don't know how to do it, get some others and help. Can you help me pray and hear from God in this situation so that what I'm praying is his will and his purpose? Because that when we pray like that, is in the name of Jesus. Are are you there? So we have this authority, we have this confidence in approaching God. Firstly, because this is who we are. We can approach God because of the gift of salvation, because we're children of God, we're sons of God, doors of God, and we come boldly approaching his throne. That's not the issue. We can come boldly saying, Father, I thank you for the gift of salvation. You've made me one of yours. I belong to you. And I'm here to honour you, worship you, and walk with you. And he's like, great. Now, in that context of who you are as a child of God, there's some purposes that I want to release through your life that are going to bring change to others around you, change to your family, change to your friends, change to your work colleagues, change in your community, change out beyond that. And often when we begin to pray, God will give some practical things that we have to do as well. It's often the ones who pray are the ones that end up going and doing. Because, you know, when you begin to pray and you hear something from God, you also begin to get a bit of a download of God's heart. And as you get a download of his God's heart, you then find, hmm, God, what do you want me to do then? It's kind of just a next steps thing that begins to happen because when you get God's heart you become more open and available as well for God what does this mean and what's that going to look like and do you want me to do something it just it's, that's how it works or seems to anyway um, so let's jump to our feet shall we and while, you, while you're jumping to your feet Matthew eleven twenty two says this Jesus said this have faith in God I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believe what is said will happen, it will be done for them. 
Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. That's, that's, a, that's two different tenses going on there. That's weird. Believe that you have received it and it will be yours. This is why when we pray, it, 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 listening to God, hearing from God is so important because when you hear something from God, it's like you receive it. It's like, you re- it's like I've received the answer. I've received his will. I've received this. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Then you begin to pray it. But the confidence that we have is that we will then, re- we have received it in here, but now we're then, we are going to see it. Yeah. It's a confidence we will, yeah. as it says here, and it will be yours. Done deal. Yeah. It's not it might be yours or it could be yours or it possibly be yours. He said it will be because you've received it in here. It's an answer on its way in reality in whatever situation you're, you're praying for and praying into. Is that all right? But he does say at the end, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone else, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your sins. We talked about praying in agreement a few weeks ago, whenever that was. And what does that mean? It's all connected. Into, it's not just pray like this one minute, pray like that the next. Relationship with God relationship with one another, praying in tongues, listening to what he's saying, hearing from God, gives you confidence. We're a child of God, so we have authority and we can pray in his name. Amen. Amen. So we're standing before him right now. We're not in the outer courts miles away. We're standing right before him. If you need to go and get your kids because of the time, if you just go and grab your kids from the kids groups, from Young Saints if you haven't done that already. And feel free to bring them back in here. We might have finished by the time you come back down, but feel free to bring them back in here. We don't mind about the noise and all of that. It's fine. Um, But we're standing before him now. And firstly, I just want you to thank the Lord for being a child of God. Thank him for your position up here. Just thank him. Jesus, I thank you that that's where I'm seated. Being seated here is not based around your feelings, your emotions, your circumstances. That doesn't mean they're not important, okay? It just means we don't live by those things. We start with here. This is who I am. This is the gift that God has given me. I'm a child of God. I'm an heir with him. This is my position. And Jesus, I don't just want to stay in that position only. I want to live in that position in the world for the people all around me And I want to exercise the authority that you've given me as a believer in prayer and in action. Because he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world, right? So just thank him. Thank you, Jesus, that I'm a child of yours. Thank you that I'm seated at the right hand of the Father with you in Christ. Thank you, Jesus, that I'm in you. I'm clothed with you. I'm clothed with power from on high. Does everybody believe this? I'm clothed with power from on high. But Father, I just yield afresh to you. I yield afresh to you. Holy Spirit, would you today, over these next few days, any way in which I'm living, how I spend my time, what I spend my time watching and doing and whatever it is, if there's anything, Holy Spirit, that I'm giving myself to in a way that you don't want me to, or I'm feeding too much on something in a way that's not healthy for me. Holy Spirit, would you show me? Because I don't want to live in a way that undermines the authority that you've given me in the way that you want me to exercise that in prayer, in the way I live, in the way I I serve you and honour you. Those two are connected the gift of all that he's given us, the delegated authority that we have as believers, but then how we live affects how we exercise that authority. So, Father, like they cried out, save us, save us, save us. Father, I just cry out afresh, I need you. I need you, Holy Spirit, afresh. I don't want to live this life in my own effort. I thank you. You've given me your spirit. You've empowered me with your spirit.
to live who you've called me to be in this world, as if you were here. Like it says in 2 Corinthians 5, we're ambassadors of a kingdom, and it says that w even in those verses, that the way we live is as if we are living or pleading or praying on your behalf as if you were here yourself. That's amazing that God entrusts us with his spirit as if he was here himself, which he is by his spirit, but he works his will out through you and me in our lives. So Holy Spirit, I thank you for all that you're doing at this time, all that you're doing amongst us. Thank you in prayer right now. So just take a moment. If you've got a situation going on, something where you need to, I need to see an answer, a breakthrough, a release, something change, whatever it is. Firstly, rather than just saying, right, I'm going to take authority over that right now, just take a moment and say, Holy Spirit, would you show me how to pray? Would you show me how to pray? I want to pray in line with your word, in line with your will. I don't just want to pray loads of words. And Jesus said, when we pray, to go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father in heaven. But he did say in that thing, and, and, but we're not heard from many words. And when you've heard something from God, it doesn't take loads of words in English. We might pray in tongues a lot. But, when we pray in English, it's like, Father, I thank you. That's what you're saying for this situation. And you know, a peace comes in, a rest comes in, turmoil goes out, and you then stand there before God in a place of rest and peace going, Father, I thank you. And right now I speak into that situation, whatever you then have to pray. I take authority over this. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I speak life into this situation or whatever it is in that, that moment, that's, that's what's happening when you receive from him. So Father, I thank you for that revelation for each person where it's needed to hear you, scripture, understanding, insight, revelation that releases faith, that releases confidence, that releases boldness to then pray with the authority that you have already released into our lives. And Father, I just pray that you teach and show us how to grow in that authority to exercise the authority you've given us as believers. Maybe for some of you today, you need to say, Father, I'm sorry that I see myself as a victim. Because if you see yourself as a victim, you won't, you won't operate, you won't live in the way that we've been talking about this morning. And God doesn't see you as a victim. He sees you as a victor. Amen. And so if anybody here today is struggling you've, and, and because of stuff that's happened or might be... Father, I, just yield that. Uh, bring yourself to him afresh. Say, Father, I just want to bring to you how I think about myself, how circumstances have shaped some of my thinking, and how I see myself and all that. Father, I, I just want to bring my mind, my thinking, my understanding under your lordship, under the mind of Christ. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you begin, would you transform me by the renewing of my mind. I thank you that you speak to me through others, through your word, speak to me directly, enable me to hear your voice, to see who I am in a different way than how I see myself at this moment. Father, would you show me how you see me, that how you see me as a child of yours, this position, who I am the confidence, the boldness that that brings and how that brings a transformation in my life. Thank you, Father. We praise your mighty name. I know time's gone, but just turn to one person next to you. Turn to one person next to you. Just pray for them right now. Pray for each other for a couple of minutes before we close this morning. Just pray for them. Bless them. Encourage them. Strengthen them. Just for... Literally 30 seconds each. That's it. Not long prayers. Just 30 seconds each. Father, I thank you for my friend. Thank you for my husband or my wife, whoever it is. I speak your blessing over their life. Thank you for them, that they would live in that authority, move in that authority, operate in that authority as a believer and see change and transformation in them and around them.